just to set some, some context, so what we're going to talk about is um, really all the cool things that Dell is doing around helping our users really modernize their storage experience. And there's a lot of things that we're going to get into as we, as we dip into the technology. But I, I did want to start off, as, as Steven said, you know, everybody is, is pretty much familiar with Dell, right? From a, um, from a logo standpoint, from, from a company standpoint, but not everybody outside of certainly, you know, this audience is really all that familiar with, you know, the different parts of the business within Dell, right? I know when people hear that I work at Dell Technologies, the first thing they ask me is, hey, can you get me a deal on a laptop, right? <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, I can, right? You know, it depends on, you know, what's going on, but usually, you know, let me know. Um, but, um, you know, with, uh, you know when, you, when you really drill into Dell's business, um, the infrastructure part of the business, the data center piece, right, which is the part that myself, Jody, and Brian represent, is a, is a really big part of Dell, and it is a really strategic part of the overall organization. And just to give you an idea, right, when you look at Dell ISG, last year, 2022, we represented about 34 billion, a little bit over 34 billion of total revenue for the company, right? So Dell's a $100 billion company, so roughly a third of that came from the other data center business. And that was ISG. And ISG, as many of you know, includes the data center products, which um, encompass servers, networking, storage, backup, security, et cetera, et cetera, right? So 34 billion comes from, from again, the data center piece. If you drill a little bit more into that, um, uh, a little bit over 16 and a half billion of that is from the storage products, okay? So if, just to put that into, into context, right? 16 and a half billion, if you were to go and look at last year's Fortune 500 list and you looked at the companies ranked by revenue, coming in at 16 and a half billion, if we were to take the storage business of Dell and spin that out, not that we're gonna, right? I'm just saying, just you know, to give you the context around that, that would put us on uh, the list at around 225, right? So it's a big organization, it's a big company. And as, as Stephen had mentioned, you know, the organization is a combination of, of Dell and the merger with EMC, which is now um, a, a little bit over seven years now, actually seven years and two months. I looked it up last night just to- I was actually gonna say, if you spun out your storage business, you could call it EMC. We, well, you know what? <laughs> Andy, that's a great suggestion. You know, when we, uh, when, we, when we start to think about that and get into some of the branding, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll add that to the, uh, to the list. But no plans, obviously, to, to spin out the, the storage bill, business. Um, because it's, it's an important part, right? If you look at the users and the types of environments and the enterprises that we work with in that space, um, there's a lot of other elements within the portfolio that we're able to drag on. And I think that was a big piece of the strategy is to basically combine the server and the networking and all the other data center pieces of Dell with the things that EMC had been very successful with for, for many, many years. The thing that I can tell you as an insider that's really changed over the seven plus years is really a, a more of a portfolio approach, right? I think if you looked at when we first came together, and I know we're talking ancient history now, we were very siloed. Right, you had different product groups that were very focused on the things that they built, the things that they developed, the things that they were delivering to their users. And there wasn't really a lot of cross-pollination between those different organizations. And that has very much changed. As a matter of fact, within our role, right, we previously worked in product management. We no longer do product management. We now do portfolio management because very rarely do we have anybody within the organization that's singularly focused on a particular product. We pretty much go across all of the different um, pieces of technologies that are included in the, in the portfolio. So again, there's been some big changes and I think you know, the results you know, really show from the work that we've done over the last seven years to really transform the business, transform the portfolio, and really make sure that we're addressing user requirements in the right way, right? Because again, one of the advantages that we have as a portfolio company is that you know, not every, not every uh, uh, nail has to be hit with a hammer. Right? We've got a lot of things that we can bring to the table to make sure that we're addressing the requirements with the right set of technologies that we can bring to the table. So 
I figured I would start here, right? Just kind of setting the context around sort of user requirements and some of the challenges that we're trying to solve. So as we know, no surprise to this audience right here, right? Organizations are trying to figure out how can they maximize the value of their information assets? What can I do with all this stuff that I know about my business, my, my users, uh, my competitors, the industry, all these things, how do I leverage that as a competitive advantage, right? In, in, order, in trying to do that, there are some headwinds, right? There's some challenges, and we've seen this for, for many years, right? And one of the big ones is we still have a lot of operational silos. You've got the server teams, the VM teams, the network teams, right? We've got cats and dogs trying to live together in harmony, and sometimes it doesn't always work. So how do we eliminate those silos and provide more operational consistency so that you know, the different elements within the stack are managed in a very cohesive way? Uh, the cloud complexity piece, right? Whether it's on premises, off premises, <laughs> to, 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 from a cloud perspective, right? A user doesn't know and a user shouldn't really care where that workload is running, right? Steven's done his job, so he can leave now. Um, developer productivity. So a lot, of you, a lot of us have been doing this for a long time and it wasn't all that long ago that if you wanted to spin up a new application, you'd go ahead and you'd open up a ticket with IT to get your VM and your storage and your compute and all of that stuff. And they would say, okay, Give us uh, 10 days and we'll come back and you can go ahead and fire up that application, right? That wasn't all that long ago that it was you know, days if not weeks in order to have infrastructure in order to deploy new workloads. That's absolutely unacceptable today. People expect you know, not just minutes, but in many cases seconds to be able to spin these things up. So how do we improve developer productivity by making these things move faster, having more automation so that there's, there's less buttons that need to be pushed by humans and just an easy way of being able to deliver the service that a developer is trying to get. The big one that comes up really over and over and over and over again is the, uh, the new world around cyber threats, right? where for years we've always been trying to build that secure perimeter, how do we keep the bad guys out? Well, that's changed because now we have to assume the bad guys, if they're not in already, they're gonna get in. So how do we minimize the damage that they can do and how do we provide a way of being able to have resiliency and recoverability so that if something bad happens, we can get the business back to the state that it needs to be. Right, so these are many of the common challenges when I talk to users and where, where we come in is you know, we're trying to help. Right? We're trying to automate the infrastructure. We're trying to provide security at every element. It's a top of mind thing that we do from a, from a portfolio management perspective in terms of the requirements that we track that go into our products. And how do we provide multi-cloud on-premises, off-premises, uh, control, right? So these are all important things. So what we're doing is we're building adaptable architectures, right? How do we take things that we can leverage to support, you know, the traditional kind of legacy side of the business, but how do we take that infrastructure and extend it to some of the newer workloads that users are, are interested in wanting to deploy kind of going forward? Uh, building in that, that cyber resiliency, as I said, you know, not a, not a question of just protecting that perimeter, which we still continue to do, but putting the recoverability and the safeguards in place so that if something does happen, we have the ability to go ahead and have a plan in place in terms of how we can get the business back up and running. And then the multi-cloud piece, right? Again, operationally, how do we provide a consistent common experience so that from a user, ex from a user perspective, whether it's here, whether it's there, they don't know, and again, they really shouldn't care. So here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the primary storage piece of the platform, PowerMax, PowerStore, and PowerFlex, right? When I did, and I just updated these numbers on the bottom, so they're all pretty current. From an R&D perspective, if you look across ISG, we're a little bit under $8 billion in terms of the, um, the investments that we make in terms of research and development. I tried to pull the number, for storage specific, and it's literally impossible to do because today with Dell, those, those stacks are so integrated. When you look at the development that we're doing around media, interconnects, ecosystem, all of those types of things, we don't have one thing that fits into a storage bucket and it fits differently into a server bucket. Those things go across all of those different elements. So we look at R&D expense, not as an individual platform, specific metric. We look at it across all of ISG because that's how we're investing our money. We're looking at a portfolio approach versus an individual product piece. But from an IP perspective, right, you know, there's a lot of cool things that we've done historically. I mean, some of these platforms that we have, you know, have been in market for, you know, over three decades, 
right? Which is, which is unbelievable because I know a lot of the folks that I talk to coming into the organization, they haven't even been on the planet for more than three decades, right? So it's kind of it's kind of cool to sort of give them that perspective and, and show them all the things that we've done from a technology perspective and how they still continue to impact everybody's lives today in terms of how they actually take advantage of the infrastructure for things like processing credit card transactions, fulfilling a, uh, a pres prescription, you know, booking an airline reservation, all these types of things. They touch the stuff that we build and develop every day. Hey, Scott. Yes. How is something like PowerMax and PowerStore, which are effectively appliance software, appliance systems yep. kind of thing, uh, able to adapt to some of the new workloads that are emerging? So yeah, it's a great question. So the question is, is how do we take you know, kind of these legacy pieces of, of infrastructure and adapt those to the new world going forward? And the, 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 traditionally the way it's, it's looked at by a lot of the users out there is they've made significant investments in that infrastructure, right? They have a lot of operational kind of um, processes in place around how they're supporting you know, their VM environments, their physical Unix servers, their mainframes, all of these things that have been around for like 100 years, almost literally, right? And what they're looking to do is as these new workloads are coming in, these new containerized apps, right? They want to be able to take advantage and leverage the infrastructure investments that they've already made. They don't want to have to build out something net new to support some of these workloads as they start to come in. They don't want to put these things on a different island than what they already have. So a lot of the work that we're doing around investments in R&D and ecosystem support, things like you know, developing our, our uh, CSM, container storage modules that sit on top of the CSI APIs that don't just present a REST interface to be able to automate the way we do management and performance monitoring and setting up replication, but connect that into the data service that actually runs into the array, making it very easy for users to be able to extend remote replication that they've been doing on VMs using SRM to manage all of that to now be able to add in the containerized workloads that are now starting to, to show up. So it's extending those into those new workloads is, is really what a lot of users are doing. If I'm doing a complete greenfield opportunity where I have a new set of workloads and I just want to kind of start over with brand new infrastructure, I don't want to take any of the tech debt that I have already in place, that's where something like PowerFlex is a very powerful play, no pun intended, right? because there's no fiber channel in that environment. There are no physical uh, host uh, uh, servers that you have to worry about. Everything is highly virtualized. Everything is highly automated. Um, so from a greenfield perspective, PowerFlex becomes a very attractive option for a lot of these organizations. And by the way, in a lot of cases, it's not an, it's not an, uh, it, it's not an or, it's an and, right? Many, if not most, or all of our users today have a mix of these different platforms, certainly the larger users that we have, because they're looking at, well, you know, I've got these applications right here, and I need SRDF for my remote replication. So that's going to continue to run on a PowerMax. I have these new workloads right here, and I have to refresh this infrastructure that sits underneath it. I'm looking for something that's scalable, something that's cost effective, something that's very reliable. PowerStore becomes a play for that. And then I have these other new workloads right here where I'm just looking to build something out and I can go ahead and I can go to the uh, to the marketplace and pick the technology and the components that I want to deploy those on that's where PowerFlex would come into play it's actually a good question speaking of tech debt I mean some of this we know uh, things are changing quickly and you just talked about some of your customers are are you going to show us what you guys have that you, that's on your truck right now that you're selling and how they map into these? Yes, okay. that's, and once I get past this runway, I'm, I'm being very pontificate okay. pontificate. I, I, yeah. I, I'm trying to tighten it up. I'm so excited to have a live audience, so that's <laughs> why, it's great. Uh, but yes, we are going to get into that. We're going to get into a lot of the technologies and, and really map what we're doing. Um, around you know how we're helping users, so let me go ahead and, and move forward. Right, the the last kind of note on this is that you know the other big shift that we've made over the last couple of years is changing the consumption models for this infrastructure. Right, for many many years, if you wanted one of these platforms, you would come in and you would give us a pile of money, and we would give you that piece of infrastructure, and you would run that in your data center for however many years until it was time to refresh, and then you would go out and buy new infrastructure to replace the old infrastructure. And more and more users are interested in moving away from that traditional capex type of a consumption model to more of an on-demand way of being able to consume infrastructure. 
So within our Apex offering, where we have a console that basically provides kind of the end-to-end -end management in terms of you know, reporting, monitoring, uh, provisioning, being able to add, being able to remove all of those things in, in one central place. It goes across the different uh, technologies that we have within Dell. And there's basically two flavors of it. One is the Apex on demand, which gives you the ability to say, well, I don't want to buy 100 terabytes. I really only need 50 terabytes today. So I just want to pay for what I'm using. And as I add 10 terabytes, 10 terabytes, 10 terabytes, just charge me for that additional 10 terabytes. But I don't want to pay for that 100 terabytes that I might not grow into for the next year or two. I want to kind of consume that on demand. So the infrastructure sits on the, on the user's data center floor. They manage it. They control it. They're responsible for kind of the day-to-day -day administration on that. But just from a consumption model perspective, they're only paying for the actual capacity that they're using in that model. The second way is the, uh, the Apex uh, data center utility, which is a managed service offering where the infrastructure still sits on the user's data center floor, but now they're not responsible for kind of the day-to-day -day administration. We go in and we, we kind of control the, the management of the array, the performance monitoring, um, the maintenance and upgrades and all of those types of things are basically now outsourced through Dell's managed services arm. Right. So both of those things fall under the Apex offering. And I think we have a question online. Yeah, so, sorry. This is Enrico here. Uh, I mean, how successful is Apex? Because, you know, when I talk with my clients, they all love the idea. But then when they talk with, the, you know, sales representatives, yep. and I'm not talking about Dell, I'm talking about, you know, the general, con you know, uh, market here. They see, oh, well, it's good, but it's very expensive in the end, and it's not as dynamic and flexible as they want you to think at the very beginning. So we we keep an eye on it, but we are not doing anything. So potentially they have a very, you know, yes, they have an interest, but they don't want to replicate okay. the mistakes that they did in the cloud. Yeah, I think I think you nailed it, right? Where I think when people look at on demand, they think it's a less expensive way of being able to buy the infrastructure, right? It's going to be cheaper to do an on-demand than it is to own the asset. And that's clearly not true, not necessarily true. It depends on, you know, the particulars of, the, of, of whatever a user is, is trying to do. But generally, people don't do it because it's going to save them money. They do it because it provides them flexibility for the things that they're trying to do. It's the classic, I can own a car or I can use an Uber. Right? If I own a car, I got a way I can get back and forth to work every day and it's going to be a lot more cost effective than having an Uber show up every day to take me to the office. Right? But that said, if I want to go out on the weekend, I can have an Uber come and pick me up and I'm going to worry about parking, I'm going to worry about driving, I'm not going to worry about any of that stuff. So, now, it, I was talking more about if you have any numbers because, because I know that you know the, the theory behind it, but actually uh, the practice is a little bit different when I, you talk with users. So, yeah, you have. A, yeah. I do. I do. Matter of fact, if you go into the uh, the latest Dell earnings release, um, I believe the number that they included in that was the the current run rate is about a billion dollar business in terms of how much revenue is coming into Dell through the uh, through the Apex offering. That includes, you know, the different platforms under the cover. So it's not one particular platform. It's it's a way of being able to consume multiple things all tied underneath Apex. But it's a billion dollar business for us right now. Yeah, that includes software, hardware, storage. That's everything. that's all in anything that fits into that Apex number is a billion, and there's a bunch of different components that get added up into that. But yes, the software, the services, the infrastructure. Okay, but the the total revenue of Dell is like ninety billion per year. Hundred billion. Yep. So we're going to get into the technology piece. So let me start off on the Power Max, right? So um, from an um, architecture perspective, so this is, you know, platform's been around for a number of years and uh, it's gone through a lot of evolutions, but, um, you know, the, the core technology of the architecture is this global memory, right? Where we're able to add in uh, compute and capacity and connect that in together over a shared memory resource, right? And we use an RDMA 
connection in order to do that. And that's what for years and years has given us the ability to take PowerMax and offer the scale up, scale out capability, where I can start off with what I need from a performance and capacity standpoint, and I can add on to that as my needs um, grow, and I need to add more resources into the storage infrastructure, right? So that's been pretty consistent. There's a number of new things that we introduced this year within the latest PowerMax release, a number of uh, real critical improvements, right? From a density perspective, that's probably one of the, the ones that is most resonating with a lot of users. The reduction in the amount of physical footprint that you need from a storage perspective with the massive increase in terms of the presentable capacity, how much storage you can fit into that form factor. So there's been a number of improvements there. There's been some changes in terms of the packaging of the platform. We've disaggregated the front end compute from the back end storage. So now if a user wants to scale the system, they no longer have to add in kind of this building block approach where they're adding compute and storage as they want to scale the system out. If they need more compute for performance, we can add it. If they need more capacity to be able to store more data, we can add it. And those two, again, are independent in terms of how we scale. And I'll take you through kind of the deeper look of, of what that looks like. From an I.O. perspective, Fiber question, please. Yes. But, uh, when you say uh, when you say next generation PowerMax architecture, is that something which has changed in the past twelve months, or is that something which is newer than so that? So we started we started shipping the the newest next generation PowerMax system in July of this year. So that's yeah. So we are July, August, September. So four or five months now uh, into the uh, initial release of the uh, of the platform, right? Uh, from an I.O. perspective in the data center, fiber channel continues to uh, be, you know, king in terms of the, the connectivity from an enterprise perspective. But we are starting to see a lot of interest in moving to uh, IP-based um, connectivity using NVMe as a protocol. Um, the mid-range space, right, that's where we're starting to see more adoption for IP-based connectivity, which is why Jody's going to talk about it. Uh, anytime upgrades, so bringing the system in, call it a version one, when that version two comes out and you know, 18, 24 months, whatever, how long it takes, um, there'll be the ability to replace the nodes on the array, right? So allowing you to upgrade to that next gen platform without having to do a data migration, without having to replace the storage array itself. So from a migration perspective, that addresses a lot of the headaches around having to move from one frame to another, where it's not just copying the data, it's all the host work, right? Um, the mapping, the masking, the device ID presentation. So this makes it really simple and easy um, to be able to move forward to new technology because you don't have to do that traditional data center migration to get you there. From a DRR perspective, data reduction. Um, our data reduction rates continue to get better as we go through different releases. And where we are right now for the typical data sets that we see in the open system space, we expect a four to one data reduction or better. We also introduce data reduction in the mainframe, which is unique, right? I used to say it was the first time data, redu uh, data reduction or compression was offered in the uh, mainframe space but then somebody who's been around longer than me will say, no, 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 Storage Tech in 1988 introduced the RVA, right? Or I'm sorry, it wasn't the RVA, that was the IBM. It was, no, whatever it was called, right? But, RVA. Yeah, yeah, but, they, but they had that, you know, like 35 years ago. So I, I stopped having that argument. But we have compression in, in the mainframe. Um, and this is all in line, done through hardware, so no performance impact when we turn this on, right? Um, from a replication perspective, we'll talk about some of these things around um, high volume, high frequency snapshots, right? We now support up to 65 million snaps within the array, and there's a very specific use case that we're targeting for that in the ability to build cyber vaults. So now being able to do um, very granular snaps on minutes in, in terms of the intervals and being able to manage tens of thousands of those snaps within, within the array, right? So I'll come back and I'll talk about that. And then it's kind of funny, last and certainly not least is, is the performance, right? This is a major refresh in terms of the hardware and the components. So we're looking at it at a, uh, a platform that's twice the performance from a, from a port perspective, from a connection perspective in terms of what the previous generation would provide. And we're looking at latencies in terms of round trip for things like cache hits that are being measured in hundreds of microseconds. So we're now sub millisecond in terms of the typical response times that we're delivering to our users. And again, it wasn't all that long ago where, you know, if you were getting five or six milliseconds, that was considered really good performance. 
right? Now you're looking at you know, a fraction of that, and that's kind of what we're delivering today from a, um, from a storage perspective. In terms of the packaging, we still have um, two different um, um, sort of offerings, right? We have the, uh, the 2500, which is a two or four node system, and then we have an 8500, which is a two up to 16 node system, right? And there's kind of two differences between the platform. One is the, um, the processors that we use between the 2500 and the 8500. The 8500 has more cores, uses faster processors, so it has a little bit more horsepower than the, uh, than the 2500. But the other difference is in the scale, right? The way we add in or connect nodes into the array is we use an NVMe connection running RDMA, or RDMA running NVMe. I always forget which one goes first, but you guys probably know that better than me, right? And the 2500 uses a direct connection, i.e. we don't use a switch. So that allows us to kind of reduce the hardware requirements and the overall cost of the platform because we don't have to use an external switch in order to connect those components. The 8500 does use a switch, and that's what allows us to be able to, to grow and to increase the node count from two to four all the way up to 16 nodes within those large configurations. What do the numbers actually mean? Which numbers? 2,500 and 8,500. Um, we had a 2,000 and an 8,000, and the good folks in marketing wanted to keep it simple and said, let's just call it a 2,500 and 8,500, literally. That's, that's <laughs> simple, okay, yeah. <laughs> Scott, you mentioned earlier that you disaggregated the front end from the back end. Do um, you have anything that shows that? There's two types of questions that I like. One is a question that I know the answer to. The second is the one that's in the next slide that's coming up, right? So the way that this works, right, is this is, a, this is an 8,000, an 8,500, it could be a, a 2,500. Um, I'm showing here two nodes on the front, two uh, media enclosures in the back. I do not need to start like this. I can start with one and one. I just did this because when I did it, it made the slide look more balanced. When you do the upgrade in place, you're saying you can actually replace the front end node without... So when I, if, I, if I pop the cover off of this, what I'll see is basically two uh, field replaceable nodes. And what I'm going to do is basically just like a service replacement, I run everything off of, I fail everything over to the other nodes that are in there. And if there's just two nodes, then everything runs on the other node. Pull the old node out, put the new node in, fail everything back to the new node, pull the old node out, pull the new node in, everything is back up and running. So you're talking minutes, literally, in order to do that upgrade. So but from a host perspective, no mapping, no masking, no changes to the device IDs, no everything is the same. Yeah. So if you actually had to upgrade the back end though, you would actually do some sort of migration or you, you don't foresee any upgrades to the back end? Well, you know, there, there will be in the future changes, right, to the types of media and the types of interconnects. But for the foreseeable future, the plan of record from an engineering perspective is to be able to support data in place upgrades um, on the node side and allowing the storage to be preserved. Now, as the media choices change over time, as we go five, six years out, right, the plans are being developed to make those migrations completely non-disruptive so that we can preserve that going forward. I can't tell you that you'll be able to take the media that you buy today and be able to replace that with things that we're going to be doing five or six years down. I can't make that commitment in front of you right now, but the plan of intent is to make these things as seamless and as easy as possible. And that dynamic fabric between the two is an IP? fabric or is it InfiniBand? Or? It's an InfiniBand uh, connection InfiniBand. and it runs NVMe as the protocol. Yep. Yep. But the idea as far as the scale out is that when I start here, if I need to add more compute, I need more performance, I need more cache, I mean, need more connectivity, I don't have to add, you know, these drive shelves that have storage in them, I can add just the media, uh, the, uh, the node technology in order to scale it out. Same thing with the storage is if I need more capacity, I don't have to add nodes in order to do that. I can add the storage without having to add the nodes and I can kind of build that out to fill the system all the way up to a total of um, um, 16 nodes on the front and eight media enclosures off of the back end. I'm sorry, how many enclosures on the back end? Eight. So each enclosure has 48 drives. So there's two, two rows of 24 drives if you pop the cover off. So that gives us 48 drive, shell, drive slots. Um, the number in, of media enclosures and the um, um, number of um, um, slots in those is going to become 
less important going forward as we start to shift to large capacity media. Because one of the other things that we changed within the platform is we introduced this concept of a dynamic RAID, right? And the way the RAID works is we're basically able to build a RAID group and to be able to stripe the parity protection across the drives that can be spread across the different media enclosures. So we can go very, very wide in terms of the striping that we're able to support. There's a lot of benefits to that. Performance, um, capacity utilization, rebuild performance, all good stuff. But one of the things that's really important for us is this sets us up with the ability to do things like single drive upgrades, right? If you look at a lot of the arrays out there today, one of the challenges that they might have going forward is how do you do capacity upgrades when you have to add everything as a RAID pack, right? Because as the capacities of these drives continue to get larger, that means when I do a eight drive, 10 drive, 12 drive, whatever it is, RAID pack, once I start to get into 15 terabyte, 30 terabyte, even 60 terabyte drives going forward, those capacity increases as you add to the system become significant, right? And what I mean by that is, if you look at just within our platform today, so single drive upgrades, in our platform today, if I go back to the earlier 8,000 in this example, we added things as part of a RAID group, right? So if I started life with 15 terabyte drives, I would have about 200 plus terabytes of effective capacity. If I wanted to add another more capacity into that system, the typical way of doing that would be to add another RAID group. Right? So I would have to do that as another eight drive RAID group into the array using those 15 terabyte drives. That means my capacity increase now becomes plus 100 terabytes in order to add capacity, which is kind of a big chunk if you don't need 100 terabytes, but that's the way the RAID protection works and that's how those capacity ads um, are, are driven. Scott, I got a question. So, so you guys are using RAID, classic RAID algorithms. Um, when you're obviously we're using SSDs, uh, you know, what are you guys doing from a RAID 5, you know, when you're doing RAID, uh, when you're doing 5 or 6 or whatever, you know? We, we support RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 6. But, so let's talk about RAID 5 and RAID 6 where you're, you know, what are you doing when you change a little bit of data in the stripe to prevent write amplification to, you know, and wear and, and unnecessary wear on, of, uh, of the NAND? So there's a lot of things that we're building in that have been built into the drives in order to preserve the rewritability of the media itself, but one of the big things that we're able to leverage is the fact that it's a cache-based architecture. So the writes and a lot of the reads actually don't necessarily have to go to the physical media, the flash drives. Those things in many cases get serviced through the, uh, through the cache. Mm -hmm. So there's all of that protection that's basically built in at the, at the drive level to minimize the exposure to wearing out the cells by doing the rewrites of the data, but a lot of that gets masked by the, the caching of the, uh, of the system. So do you rewrite stripes in place? I'm sorry? You do rewrite stripes in place, you don't write them somewhere else? Mm, yeah, I would have to check on that. I believe when we have a new write come in, we put it into a new piece of the, uh, into the media. Okay. But what we do is we rewrite that in the cache, and the way it works is kind of locality of reference. If you have an active um, data set, you'll rewrite, 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 and we're not constantly writing that down to the flash. We're keeping that into the, into the cache until a point that you know, the data kind of cools in terms of the access patterns, and then we'll actually go ahead and do a physical write to the back end. And that's what allows us to, um, to get into that higher capacity media that you know, typically have, I shouldn't say this, but from a, um, you know, the, a rewrite perspective, there's, there's differences in terms of the media types and the technologies that are that are put into the array, but we've got you know some of the smartest people you know within within storage kind of looking at this and understanding what the capabilities are um, of the technology that we're using and what the requirements are from a system perspective in terms of what we need to preserve the durability of the uh, of the media. Are um, rebuild times improved uh, rather yes. than spinning or SSD. Uh, so the rebuild just keep growing and growing and growing. So the, the the metric that we have is that the rebuild performance on this, and I have a slide. I took it out just because I, I had too much content. Is um, we see about uh, a terabyte. Uh, a ter it takes about ten minutes, less than ten minutes, to rebuild a terabyte of data. 
and that's under load. That's not just doing a straight up rebuild. That's you know a typical you know utilized system. I think the number we did was like 50% utilized. I'd have to check that for sure. But as a, a system that's under a typical workload, if we had to rebuild data from a drive, we'd be able to do that at uh, a terabyte in 10 minutes. And that's RAID 5 and RAID 6, it really doesn't matter. Uh, I did wanna share this with you, right? So the move to high capacity drives um, does become important, right? Because you know, if you look at particular floor tile and even power per floor tile, those are things that are becoming more and more for, uh, important for a lot of data center folks. So the ability to use, this is taking a look at what it'll look like in thir with 30 terabyte drives that we'll be introducing um, um, later next year. Um, and we have higher capacity drives that we are looking at leveraging in the future. But the, the important thing is the way you get to these high capacity drives and the way we're able to take advantage of some of the improvements around density and performance is by being able to have an architecture that allows you to do things like a single drive upgrade. Because you can't use this high capacity media if you have to add 10 drives at a time in order to scale the system out. So just something to consider, right, kind of going forward, that the density increases in order to take advantage of it. You need to have granularity and flexibility in terms of how you so can Scott, scale the system up. the first two columns on that chart are just the fact that you've increased the number of drives per system, um, both 15 terabyte SSDs. Is that how I read that? that so the, so the, the dark blue line is based on um, some of the restrictions or limitations around uh, the caching of that platform and how much external storage we could present. The light blue line is the current release with the 15 terabyte drives that has the added cache resources so we can provide more, more presentable more storage per yeah, yeah. node. And then the, the next blue line the is going terabyte. from the 15 so to are, are these TLC or QLC drives? I'm, I'm just not sure. These are the drives we're currently using are TLC based drives. TLC. Yep. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that we've been doing for many, many years within PowerMax around security. And we kind of bucket it into three areas, right? We have the storage security piece, things that we're doing on the array, the host and app piece, things that we're integrating in um, to the, uh, the applications and the actual data that, that we're running, and then the things that we're doing around um, admin control, right? So a lot of the things that you'd expect to see, multi-factor, encryption, um, the ability to do secure snaps, right? Those are things that you know, we've been doing for a while and things that users are taking advantage of, right? They're, they're leveraging these features as some of the core things that they're doing around building secure environments. Um, one of the new things that we've introduced within this, and this includes both PowerMax, PowerStore, as well as PowerFlex, is the ability to use the new Intel technology that has the hardware root of trust built into it. Right? So this allows us to do that authentication. So as we're booting a, a system for the first time, or as we're rebooting components within the system as part of upgrades, service, maintenance, device drivers, those types of things, we can authenticate those upgrades and those changes to make sure that somebody hasn't gotten in there and has made some sort of change or made it a, a, um, a way, provided a, a way of being able to get backdoor access to the infrastructure by being able to go in and modify the code, right? So this is something that actually started in the Dell server days, right, back in the, uh, the 14G days from back in 2017. So not, not necessarily a new concept from a Dell perspective, um, but certainly one of the things that we're now leveraging across the portfolio in terms of being able to provide storage level security. One of the other things that we're introducing are things like anomaly detection, right? Because when it comes to things like ransomware, one of the challenges is, is, is not just, you know, um, um, you know, knowing when, when a hack occurs, but minimizing the window between when it does occur and when you actually find out, right? It's how long have they been in there? Is it a day? Is it a week? Is it a month? Is it several months? So one of the things that we're building into the, uh, into the monitoring tools is the ability to understand the, the typical attack profile for ransomware, right? Looking at things like, you know, is encryption all of a sudden happening in areas that we hadn't seen encryption before? Are there data sets or extents that now all of a sudden the type of um, uh, profiles that we had seen historically, those are starting to change. So in the initial release of this, we're basically looking at any types of changes that fit that profile for a ransomware attack and providing an alert to a user to say, hey, 
something looks different within this, within this workload. Something has changed, giving users the ability to go in there and kind of take a look to see, okay, what's going on and have I been hacked and when did that hack actually happen? So trying, trying to kind of minimize that window of exposure and helping users understand when those types of attacks have occurred and to be able to... How do you really do it on the technology kind of perspective? Because some vendors do like check the CPU, um, Utilization that goes up to 100%, and some more rights are increasing on the storage system. Do you have like metrics or? So, uh, probably a good drill down discussion, but when we look at the types of attacks that we've seen in working with our users, they, they fit, generally speaking, a couple of common profiles in terms of what those attacks look like and how they go in and alter the data that's being written into the array. So what we're doing is we're looking at those, those types of metrics, the, the telemetry for that, so that when we see those things that have fit the profiles for those types of hacks that we've seen, right? So if you look at the encryption piece, right? When people go in and they encrypt um, a part of an application in order to, you know, charge ransomware in order to get the key so that you can unencrypt that data, the type of encryption that they use, there's a couple of very specific ways that they're going in and they're doing that. So we're looking for those types of changes. So it doesn't mean that we have everything covered because these things are going to continue to evolve. But I think the, the broader scope of this is that we do have the intelligence and the ability to build that telemetry in. So as those things continue to evolve, as you know these types of attacks continue to change, we can go in and we can modify the behavior that we have in being able to identify those types of things quicker. Right, so hey, we're doing it. Yes. Hey, it's, it's Jody. Just, uh, hi, Jody. Just to, on, just to touch on that point a little bit. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll go into too much into detail, but I, I did write an article on this that kind of goes through detail with Plot IQ integration. So there's a couple of things we do today already uh, that, that are anomaly-based uh, anomalies that we uh, alert and can notify on. The other one is performance-based anomaly and detection. So think if as Scott mentioned, a, a workload all of a sudden starts encrypting and it wasn't before, that's gonna be a capacity-based trigger anomaly where things are growing out of character, we're gonna notify the user. There's also the, the profile if somebody cranks up on a host, starts running an encryption algorithm or starts doing some kind of scan or assess on the file system or the data set, that IO profile maybe goes from 5,000 IOs to 1,000 or 6,000 IOs, for example. So that's a, a performance-based anomaly that we would also trigger an alert notification on and then you're getting into where things are going with basically profiling the IOs that Scott is talking about. So there's a couple of those things we're already doing and implementing today. Right, so once you do find an attack or something happens and you do need to recover, we do have um, a, a set of uh, best practices around building a secure cyber vault. So it's a combination of a couple of things that are available within the platform, things like secure snaps, being able to write a snap and protecting that snap from being deleted, being changed, being overwritten, those types of things. Um, but also being able to uh, really increase the scale and the velocity of how we can, uh, uh, how many snaps we can take and how quickly we can make those snaps. And I just wanted to give you kind of a math example here, right? So if I had a single storage device and I wanted to follow the Dell recommendation around a cyber vault where I do a 10 minute snap and hold it for uh, 48 hours, two days, but then also do a, uh, a one hour snap and hold that for seven days, that means for each application, each storage device, each LUN, in the array, you need over 400 snaps in order to do that, right? So multiply that out by the typical number of devices, right? Something like 5,000 devices, that means you're looking at 2 million snaps um, in order to support that use case. And that's not counting snaps for other things that you'd be using for things like offloading, reporting, and, and doing backups and, and other um, um, ways that people typically use snaps. So it does, it's an important number in the scale and being able to grow and support that. And you do the math on that, right? At 65 million snaps, that means this use case with this level of granularity, this 10 minute RPO, gives us over 150 devices, 150,000 devices within the array that we can support, right? And there's a lot of arrays out there that are limited to hundreds of thousands. And the challenge that you have at that level of scale, you do the math on this, you're looking, you know, two, 300 total devices within the array that you can support before you start to run out of the amount of snaps that that platform can, can provide. What the heck is a virtual air gap? A virtual air gap is a, uh, a cool way of thinking of a, uh, a snap, a, ver uh, a secure snap. 
where you have the ability to split that off. It's not a physically separate air-gapped type of a um, um, copy that you can physically disconnect the connection to that array in doing a physical air gap, but a virtual air gap, meaning that it gives you the controls of being able to separate that and maybe not completely preventing a user from being able to go in and get at that snap, but making it very, very, very hard for people to be able to, to do that. I guess the question is, can it be deleted by an, an admin? Nope. Is it something that gets expired over a certain period of time, things right. like that? That's exactly how it works. You set a policy that says this snap deletes after 60 days, and there's no way for somebody to go in there and delete the snap. There's no way for somebody to go in there and change the snap. There's no way for anybody to go over there and overrun the snap. So what that does is it puts that snap into a protected state. So if the array were to run out of capacity, the way a lot of storage works is that as that capacity starts to fill up, we never want to fail the write. Right, so once we get to 99% full, we're looking at things that we can you know, do in order to free up space. And one of the things that a lot of arrays will do is start to terminate snaps that are old. You, right? can't, you can't change the clock forward to try to bypass that? Mm -hmm. On the array? Yeah, on the array, or, or set it, or set, uh, get an NTP server that sends it a, a time that changes it, or? I, have, I would have to check and see how difficult that would be, but I haven't heard anybody ever. Like a compliance clock, you right? You cannot. Yeah, you can't you can't do like an NTP spoof to That's what I mean. trick the trick the array to expire. So particularly in a PowerMax architecture, the the system clock is not accessible. So it's it's not like you can do an NTP spoof and then say, oh, I tricked you, expire all these snapshots. It's not possible. And you can't set the time in in in, in the CLI, I guess. No, the only the only way to do that is via direct access via SIM CLI. Uh, so you'd have to have you know, localized, very specific access via and via support at the initialization of the array to be able to do it when the system's coming online. But as far as moving forward, the only people that could do that would be our our support staff. So you're saying there's still a chance. I'm saying there's a chance. Right? <laughs> well, that's important. Thanks. It it is. No, it, it actually is. So you know, just having some form of man in the middle or an NTP spoof that's Hey, you got a secure snapshot. But what if my array tells you it's next Thursday and everything's gone now? Right? So 